hello everyone. My name's Dr. John Barton. Um, I'd like to show my respects and acknowledge the medical people who are the traditional custodians of the land and the elders past and present on which this meeting takes place, or at least my side of the meeting. We're uh, joined by um, a group of uh, experts from uh, all across Australia are actually uh, uh, between them. I think we've got a good coverage of the, the whole continent and uh, and beyond. Um, we're joined by uh, David Major, who's the founding director of Theory Weary. Uh, David's a UN Monero man, co-founder of Theory Weary. He spent 25 years working in land and heritage management in the ACT, New South Wales and Victoria, and along with his Theory Weary co-founder, Jason Adler, they're the only first people in Australia to have sat in the executive of a government land management agency. Theory Weary supports innovative approaches to partnerships between First Nations communities, uh, government corporates, uh, building shared capacity, capability, advocating for connection to country and a primary role for the traditional owners in management of their cultural landscapes. Um, welcome, David. Yep. And um, uh, also we're joined, joined by uh, Rowan Fisher. Um, uh, Rowan's the, the lead satellite-derived fire information analyst for the North Australian Fire Information Service at the Darwin Centre for Bushfires Research and the current PhD candidate at Ch uh, Charles Darwin University. Satellite image, and he's a satellite image analyst for 27 years and subsequently for the uh, Northern Territory Government. His current research and training development work is focused on developing uh, projection augmented landscape models using low tech tools to create a dynamic spatial holograms of country. Um, we're um, also joined by uh, Stephen Walker. Um, and Steve, if you're, if you're there, turn your, um, turn your video on please and your microphone. Um, Steve Walker's geos, uh, geospatial data analytics and AI advocate. He's a, uh, a supporter of Indigenous opportunity. He's a strategist uh, in health tech and prop tech. As a certified Indigenous service provider, his company um, Spartan First focuses on occupational health and promote Indigenous opportunity and welfare. And they're leveraging location intelligence to enable increased social, cultural, economic benefits for the Indigenous communities. So, um, without further um, ado, we'll move on to the panel session. Um, uh, uh, Rohan, um, so could you tell us a bit about um, your background working up in the top end and how you've been using um, uh, working with the uh, the um, traditional owners of the land and um, working with uh, also quite high tech applications? Can you tell us why um, the traditional aspect is so important to uh, land management in Australia? Oh, thanks very much, uh, Jack. Um, yeah, so I think it's probably good to realise that the most fire-prone landscapes in the world are those in northern Australia. So um, about 70% of uh, fires that occur across Australia, the Australian continent occur in the tropical savannas um, in the north um, and about, you know, I guess another 20-25 uh, in the, the rangelands. So uh, relatively few fires occur in the sort of southeast coastal region of Australia, although when those fires do occur, as they did uh, earlier this year, um, they have fairly severe impact. But um, yeah, so fire is really an incredibly important part of uh, all of uh, the, the landscape of Australia, but particularly the north, where we on average get about 30% of uh, the tropical savannas burn each year. And that's primarily due to the fact that uh, we have a, a wet, dry, monsoonal um, climate and every year we get uh, massive uh, fuel loads, uh, grass fuel loads, and every year they will burn regardless of whether or not there is uh, um, you know, human management of fire in those landscapes. Fortunately, for approximately 70,000, 80,000 years, there has been um, human management of fire in those landscapes um, and the, the co-evolution of those ecologies are, are really quite quite significant. Um, and what's occurred over the last uh, uh, 15, 20 years has been this uh, really groundbreaking partnership between Northern Australian scientists and uh, traditional landowners and traditional knowledge holders across the North to start to uh, reinstate some of the um, 
traditional uh, fire management practices, uh, albeit with some new technology. Um, there's a lot of helicopter and sendry drop work that's done across the north now, as long as uh, as well as uh, ground-based um, fire management. Um, but it's really building off a, a basis of um, supporting that traditional knowledge and traditional understanding of. Uh, good land management um, and what has happened with the uh, um, work with uh, northern australian scientists has been the understanding of um, the impacts that good management and one of the impacts has been a radical reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and that's led to the development of what's called now the uh, savannah burning carbon farming industry, which is part of the uh, national sort of legislation around um, carbon abatement, the federal government. So that's then led to a $30 million a year um, industry across northern Australia, largely led by Indigenous land managers on Indigenous lands. Um, so an incredible uh, success. What we have seen in Northern Australia is a reduction in fire severity and extent of approximately um, 150,000 square kilometres per year area less burnt. Um, this is despite increased climate change challenges in the north as it is elsewhere in Australia. So what we're seeing in Northern Australia is I would I think uh, argue is probably the best fire management in the world at the moment and it's really based importantly on that strong link between local indigenous knowledge and land managers and their incredible hard work on land and linking that in with the, the science then links in with these sort of support me mechanisms um the larger sort of climate change work um, my role in all of this is a uh, relatively small, but uh, supporting a quite a significant piece of technology which assists that, which is, as you mentioned, Jack, the North Australia Fire Information website, where we provide burn area mapping on a weekly basis for all of um, the Northern Territory, most of Queensland, um, and the vast majority of uh, Western Australia. So that now covers that burnt area mapping covers 70% of Australia and provides updated hotspots um, in about a five to 10, uh, sorry, about half an hour to two hour interval. And the real focus of that fire information website is on providing a resource which is very easy to use. You find a lot of uh, technology-based um, disaster response sites, particularly fire, is either based for emergency service personnel or developed by a sort of a technology-focused uh, group. This is really based on feedback from land managers for land managers to be as easy as used as possible to support their land management activities. So what we find across Northern Australia through all the different range of groups, one of the first things that they will do in the morning is they'll wake up, have a cup of coffee, turn on the computer and have a look at NAFI. So NAFI is the shorthand for North Australia Fire Information, but across the North, it's been going for 20 years. So it's been become part of the deep culture of land and fire management amongst Indigenous and non-Indigenous land managers across whole, the whole of Northern Australia, a key, key resource. And I think that I want to emphasise there that the key thing is not being focused on the technology. The key thing is being focused on how to augment um, those sort of land management, that land management knowledge. That's fantastic. That's that's really strong. Thanks, Rohan. I was, um, one of the, the things about Climate change is that it, you know the, it's often a, it's, you know the frog in the the uh, boiling pot uh, analogy where you've just had, got such small incremental changes. But having been active in the scene for twenty years, over twenty years, and um, to actually be on top of that, where you're, you're um, working with the carbon cycles with a full evidence based program that's connecting multiple users across the um, the the um, area um, it's um, that's yeah a remarkable um, initiative um, and um, we'll um, try to circulate some of those URLs to the the people who are joined in the chat and a bit later um, I'm just getting a message from um, Steve um, saying am I here he might be having some trouble um, logging in but um, I will deal with that in a second Mick goes there in the background so um, David um, how are you going uh, can you uh, turn yourself off mute you're on mute How's that? Good, good, good. Um, can you tell us a bit about uh, TheoryWerry? Yeah, look, I've been lucky enough for 25 years to work in primarily public land management. 
uh, in southeastern Australia uh, and, and primarily in supporting partnerships between traditional owners and land managers in looking after country, uh, whether that be through formal recognition or through joint management or through just partnerships in areas like fire or, or weed management or coastal erosion or all those sort of areas. So uh, so Theory Weary as a company uh, is, is just an extension of that for me in being able to do that with not only public land management organisations now, but also with with private conservancy organisations, community landholders, uh, and other government departments, in who are regulators or influencers in the way policies get uh, put in place around the management of country. Fantastic. And um, how, what what's been the um, the oh good here comes Steve. I've just got a little pop up. Um, so what what's been some of the experience you've had with the the different um, community groups, going right from the high level government? I can imagine there's a lot of energy you're putting into that but but what about sort of um you know the younger um communities and um, um bringing together different groups that might not have worked together before in this issue what are some of your experiences there i reckon um our communities our elders and our young people have been wanting to be in this game for as long as i've been in the game myself yeah. it's just been government not really being ready to understand uh the difference between science and knowledge yeah. That's one of the strongest things for me. So I think getting people, uh, getting land managers primarily to understand that that knowledge and 60,000 years plus of knowledge and connection with country is a valuable resource in looking after country. And as the as the journey around recognition and rights and native title has shifted and land's being returned to traditional owners, uh, whether it be through uh, freehold ownership through native title or through joint management through Indigenous land use agreements, that knowledge uh, it's being put at the front of the conversation and that the people making the decisions are not just the land managers or the scientists, it's also the traditional knowledge holders. Mm. So, so just like Rowan said, I think the, the thing for me isn't techniques, it's knowledge because our culture has always been an adaptive and evolving culture and you use whatever the best techniques you have available to you at the time. Yeah. So, you know, that's why I often rail against the word traditional being used in this right. conversation. <laughs> People think it means old stuff from the past, you know, yeah. uh, where, where, you know, you don't be the oldest living culture without being able to adapt and, and change and use the best techniques in front of you. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Well, so what, what, how have you um, been using technology in that um, that capacity? Is it, um, what, what are some of the most useful technologies you've been um, dealing with? I think, I think GIS is, is a, uh, is the thing I'm most excited about and have been for 20 years, you know, right from the from the start of that being used in land management. And it almost feels like technology is catching up with the way our old people saw country. Mm -hmm. So that, that bird's eye view of country, which you see through our artwork across Australia and probably around the world, is its own form of GIS, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that our elders and our knowledge holders have taken really well to GIS and, and the way that you can map country. Yeah. Uh, there are some challenges in that around tangible and intangible cultural values and how you can record intangible values using a point and polygon type system. But I think the technology is adapting to cope with that. Um, probably the two the two uh, areas that we still need to keep working on is around data sovereignty. So who owns the information and, and, and how is it used? Uh, and then the challenge of uh, GIS is an awesome tool, but it's it's quite IT heavy. Uh, in that you've got to be able to have the hardware and the software at, the, at its most up-to-date level and you've got to be using it all the time to be adept with it and that's not something that our community organisations necessarily are able to equally take part in. Sure. sure. So, they're, so they're the things that, you know, whilst I advocate for GIS, we need to make sure that we take everybody with us in the way sure. that it's used and the way that it influences um, uh, strategy and policy. Great, thanks. Um, so, Rohan, I see you're, you're nodding your head there. Um, the um, the uh, what you've done with um, the the web based um, information streams really good. That people, as you say, they get up, they have their cup of coffee, and then they're informed about what's going on around them. That's really important for the. I, I found generally the accessibility of these tools is improving, but still they're very much sort of expert things that you need to understand. How, how, how have um, you found it with the visualisation side or engaging with the, the broader community using these tools? Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> yeah. The old, the old yeah, mute-a-rooney. 
confirm what uh, David said. I mean, the, for, for me, the, the technology, those technology skills are transferable. They're, they're relatively easy and the, the, the science is doable. But the, the key that underpins all of this is the, is the knowledge. And I think that's one thing that we've done well in the North, where um, the science has been there to augment and support the knowledge as opposed to the other way around and the tech also. Yeah. Um, and also, just, in, just to comment on... Um, what David said as well. I mean, a lot of my work um, over the last 20 years has really been trying to decentralise uh, geospatial skills and capacity because, uh, you know, that there is a, a learning curve to um, learn some of the GIS skills, but um, anyone can do it with, with patience and, and mentoring. But uh, what, what you can't easily transfer is um, many generations of, of knowledge. So um, mm. I think that's where there needs to be um, more work is to sort of integrate uh, the, the, the transference of some of these technical skills to those real um, the people actually hold the knowledge. Um, yeah, because uh, yeah, that's where the, 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 the true power is. Um, in terms of um, data visualization, information visualization, I mean, there's something that you you mentioned earlier around the work that I've been doing. Um, using the sort of 3D landscapes to try and um, help transfer geospatial knowledge understanding. Um, and this is really trying to bring some of the fuel load accumulation information that comes from the North Australian Information website into a sort of a 3D interactive format, which enables people to really sort of visualise how fire might behave over the landscapes. So this is using um, what I call pretty um, blunt edge technology. It's essentially um, 3D printed landscapes and I project over top of that simple fire simulations. But uh, it creates a, um, a physical um, and tangible um, space on which uh, local knowledge holders can once again sort of share their understanding of uh, fire behaviour and sort of facilitate those conversations. And uh, yeah. for me, that's, a, that's what the technology is all about, how, how you can use the tech to um, bring together people who really have that deep understanding of a, a country and the way that uh, that landscape that landscape works. And there's some neat things that we can we can do to support that now. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, for me, the key is not to be obsessed by the tech. It's just how the tech yeah. can really underpin that local knowledge. Sure. Excellent. And, uh, I, I mean, yeah, <laughs> that that knowledge is something that, that's um, pretty uh, unique and, you know, able to be well communicated um, at times. Um, it's certainly not, not a trivial thing to be able to just put it into some, you know, you can't put it into a database and share it or whatever. But um, I think that's certainly, um, you, as you say, having the technology that you can put on the table, the outputs of that technology and be able to start those conversations. Um, so, getting um, Rohan, getting back to David's um, point too. I mean, what are what are what are some of your biggest challenges with regard to working to the gov with with the government up there? Would you say in the federal and federally? Would you say everything's rosy, or are there um, um, particular challenges um, that you'd? Uh, Northern Territory governments are very good in terms yeah. of uh, their work across jurisdictions. I mean, there is a very strong understanding in the Northern Territory generally that uh, the dominant land owners and land managers are uh, uh, traditional owners um, sure. and mm, the majority of parks, NT parks, are jointly managed. The main issue um, in the Northern Territory is a lack of resources, um, you know, we're very small in terms of population and uh, we really just don't have the, the resources to support uh, uh, the sort of uh, land management activities and support activities we'd like. So the North Australia Fire Information website, because it covers 70% of Australia, um, essentially needs to be a federally funded uh, tool. However, because it's not focused on the sort of immediate emergency response needs of southeastern Australia, where the majority of people live and where the majority of uh, interest is, particularly after last year's fires, we continue to sort of um, uh, battle for sort of uh, substantial ongoing support after 20 years for what has become a critical tool for um, land managers over most of Australia. Um, and particularly Indigenous land managers are achieving sort of incredible, incredible results. So I think I think that's the, the battle we have is trying to raise the platform, particularly if you're looking at fire, as something which is um, only be 
really becomes a uh, an emergency and disaster response issue if you haven't had you know um, decades of good land management um, preceding that. So, in the first instance, we see it as a land management uh, more of an NRM issue. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, so David, what are you um, are you resonating with uh, some of that? The, coming from the eastern um, seaboard, um, where you've got uh, much more attention, and you've certainly yeah you know, we've we've had the uh, the nineteen uh, twenty twenty bushfire season, which although it put you know got a lot of media, um, we had, there were certain um, newspapers and conglomerates that were uh, saying climate change isn't even happening. You know, it's not a problem. Um, would you say you've been? Uh, how have you been reacting to all that attention? I think I think that. Um despite all the climate deniers out there, I reckon there's a much bigger shift in the community and certainly within government land management agencies to recognise Aboriginal cultural knowledge. Mm. Uh, you know, it's it's quite um, it's quite ironic, I think, for, for some of our uh, Indigenous-led uh, cultural management processes that now people are listening, you know, after all the fires yeah. have happened. Yeah. So, but, you know, I think our communities will take whatever chance we can to get in there and be part of the conversation. Uh, so, and and I think, I think uh, I agree with Rowan absolutely about knowledge being the priority. But our communities, because we're in such a complex situation, uh, with you know massive communities living in forested areas and uh, and the, the the challenges around managing country uh, that's so heavily used, is that technology is is essential. Yeah. Uh, so I think our, our I think our communities are uh, will will embrace this stuff and are embracing. The technology, as long as they feel like they're in the driver's seat. Mm. Now, I think I think gone are the days when someone came and took your knowledge and put it in a box and took it away somewhere and you didn't hear from them again. Uh, you know, we're not we're not doing that anymore. Yeah. Uh, when we, it's about having a seat at the table and being able to make the decisions, and then you use the the techniques and specialists to provide you the support you need to make good decisions. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, look, just, just anecdotally, I mean, have you been, uh, when you're out in the bush, have you been sensing anything different, you know? Has, has, have, have you uh, have you been sort of speculating yourself, saying, hang on, I haven't seen them there before. Is this something to do with climate change? Or, uh, you know, well, have, have, is there anything you've, you've sort of concerned about that you've been seeing happen in the, uh, the uh, natural uh, environment that, that might be unusual? Yeah, look, everything's massively out of whack. Um, <laughs> You know, it, okay. it, it, look, uh, and I think that um, this is the challenge around um, around using our cultural knowledge systems when the system's been broken, uh, and you know, and having to uh, use the knowledge we've got but adapt it to the situation that we're in now, and our communities yeah. are struggling with that on a daily basis. But it's yeah. not stopping them uh, with that absolute commitment to looking after country and healing country. Uh, you know, I mean, we we uh, we spend a lot of time talking with organisations like Fire Sticks. Uh, the Fire Sticks Alliance, uh, and and you know, despite all the challenges in front of our communities, not only with the health of their country, but the way that their knowledge is respected, they're going to keep moving forward. And and the big change I'm seeing is that we're getting young people in our communities now who are tech natives. Yeah. So they they they're being able to translate um, and work with their elders to be able to use the knowledge in the sharpest way that they can. Very deadly. Right. And Rohan? Um, I, I guess in terms of, uh, say, fire management across northern Australia, um, I guess the, the the clearest impact has been um, greater variability with uh, sort of onset of monsoon and length of the monsoon, um, but also some fairly severe sort of fire weather conditions as well. So um, it really requires more not less intensive land management under these these sort of situations um i mean we've seen um fires spotting in uh, in central arnhem land in um contexts where you you really wouldn't have seen that before and we've just also gone through a few years of drought um across the north and the kimberley in particular has suffered with some large um fires and poor monsoon um, related events. Um, so yeah, the, the, the challenges in um, fire management um, will keep getting greater, um, but they, it also means that this sort of proactive fire management work becomes more and more important as we go forwards, even as it becomes more challenging. Absolutely. 
Um, well, I, do, I might just mention as well, I mean, some of the things we're trying to do with the, the technology, um, the, particularly the uh, North Australia Fire Information website, is um, uh, try and find different platforms that we can share that information. So uh, we're currently developing the mobile app, um, trying to keep that as simple as possible, but also allowing sort of offline use of it. Um, so people have this um, land management fire information tool in their pocket at, at all times. So, I mean, more and more people are moving away from uh, accessing their, their technology through a computer uh, onto a mobile phone. So trying to move with that. And we've also launched a uh, QGIS um, plugin quite recently as well. Um, and part of that will be um, trying to get people who, um, particularly Indigenous land managers, are already sort of uh, used to using the website NAFI and trying to build capacity around using sort of QGIS as a platform to accessing that fire information. Yeah, very cool. Um, we've got a, um, a uh, question from the audience, um, and uh, it's um, from my boss, actually, Sissy, who a lot of you might know. Um, <laughs> she's asking a very good question. Um, would you like to work with researchers to advance technology? <laughs> you, you feel free to say no. <laughs> Are there any sort of little things that are that um, are um, uh, kind of frustrations that you're not able to get around to in the the normal work day and the work environment? I know you're doing your PhD, Rohan, and and so um, um, what are some of the the uh, collaborations that you've? How about we talk about outside your um, area of expertise? Like, um, what are some of the areas that you might be able to um, cross over with outside of your um, direct um, um, area of focus? Uh, with with our work, um, I think what we're trying to do is how we can take the information that we uh, have developed, um, the the fire twenty years worth of fire history, and working with res researchers to understand um, particularly some of the uh, uh, ecological implications of different fire regimes across northern Australia. How can we we can then produce um, ecological metrics based on these fire data which then go into a really um, easily understandable um, format for fire managers. So I might just, um, segueing off this, mention another tool that we've got. It's um, called uh, SMRF, the Savannah Metrics Evaluation Research Framework. Uh, it's a bit long-winded, but if you anyone goes to Google and types in SMRF dashboard, they will come up with a sort of a fire information portal, which is using the 20 years plus information from NAFI to then produce a whole range of fire information metrics. So this is directly derived from the research, but is also in a form that land managers um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous can really easily sort of understand to get a bit of a snapshot on where they're going on their on-country um, fire management. So, um, yes, we do We do already work extensively with, with researchers, um, yeah. but that is also really very much driven by um, the requests from land managers on the ground, what they want to see. Um, yeah. So very applied focus. Yeah, a great example of, um, like you say, you know, it's not about the technology, it's about the people and the uh, the knowledge. So, uh, yeah. Okay, well, thanks, um, Rohan. We're down into our last um, um, three minutes. So, um, David, how, what if your, what's your crossover been like with the research community? Yeah, uh, look, I think there's some opportunities for some good work in this space, but I think um, the, the, the space that we're moving into is trying to find a middle ground. Uh, and I think one of the most successful tools that, I used uh, during my time at Parks Victoria, you know, in a, in a in a landscape that's got everything from snow to desert to coast to, to and massive issues around fire and water, uh, is that we've what we tried to arm our land managers with down there is the ability to use a GIS fronted access database for the want of another term to be able to identify who are the right people to talk to when you're in different parts of country. So the technology doesn't have to hold the knowledge; the technology can just point you to who has the knowledge. But, yeah, uh, it's, so, yeah, you know, in this area, there are sensitivities. Talk to this small. In this area, you have to be yeah. careful of this. Speak to this person. That, uh, yep, yep. And our communities are feeling much more comfortable with that because that's sort of like a halfway point to get everyone used to working closely with each other because it's about relationships and trust and respect in yep. this space. Yep. That's the most important thing. I don't think we can take the technology past where people are up to. 
Yeah, sure, sure. And but and also, I mean, really, you know, I, I, when you think about it, we've, the technology is we've never had it in our history of humanity. You know, where, where it's at now, where we can just communicate globally and in an instant, it's it's pretty. Pretty exciting as to, to how, how how we will be able to use it. I think in the future, but um, yeah, I used to do a lot of work at um, national parks, doing very similar things where we'd have the, as you say, the points and lines and things, but also say, you know, this this hatched area is is talk to that person, you know, and yeah, <laughs> it's a good way for directing. We don't lose the protocols of cultural knowledge. Yeah, but I sure, think that's sure. really important. Yeah. Um, hi, look, I think um, Steve, uh, are you online? I, I got a message yep. saying that um, you're here. Good. Yes, yes, okay. I am here. Sorry, sorry for coming in late. I, Teams no. was telling me that that I was on on, but uh, I obviously wasn't, so I switched to the web version. Um, you, I, yeah. I just want to make a couple of couple of points uh, about things that uh, David and Rowan were talking. I Good. think yeah. Uh, geospatial is now becoming a little bit more democratised and for, for everyday use, and especially the the young crowd that are coming through who use their mobile phones and other technologies, which is which is a benefit. Um, the the second point is that the use of that technology is is not the panacea, right? It can it can help visualise, but what we should be doing is is modelling with that technology rather than looking to the past, looking to the future, and then aligning that with the cultural knowledge, right? Now, that sounds like it's an easy thing to do, but not necessarily. But then once we've got that, then we can go to government. Government are very, very poor at dealing with dealing with things that might happen, right? They're very good at, at um, you know, it's like the old saying about economists. They have a 50% accuracy in predicting the past, right? <laughs> so so it's a matter of what you take to government. And uh, taking David's point, there are so many vested interests across Indigenous communities that, that there's no single voice. You know, you have to deal with, with different people and different strategies in different geographies right across Australia. Um, so th there is no simple answer here, but, but I think we're heading down the right path. I really do. I think we've got the technology to align with, with cultural knowledge and, and we have the ability to, to make governments listen. I think we have that. So that's what we need to do. 